Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you uh, for uh, coming along here to the Safeguarding Overview and uh, Scrutiny uh, Committee. Um, item one, are there any apologies? Uh, no apologies, Chair. Thank you. Uh, declarations of interest? Strangely, can I uh, express uh, two? Uh, with regard to item four, the actual uh, report, um, one of the organisations that was criticised in that report uh, was Cambridge University, in particular the criminology uh, department. Um, I hold a master's degree from Cambridge University, issued by that very criminology uh, department, uh, and I'm also a member of the evidence-based policing uh, committee that runs uh, from the university and have an involvement in various projects. However, I would stress I had no involvement uh, whatsoever in this particular uh, initiative that was run by the university. Um, and also, unusually, uh, the next item, the prevent uh, item. Uh, uh, when I was a, a, a police officer, I was a member of the counter-terrorism unit for the four forces uh, that make up the West Midlands, uh, including Staffordshire. Uh, and I had specific responsibility for several years for delivering the prevent uh, strategy. Um, I have uh, asked uh, for some advice about uh, whether any of uh, those declarations should prevent me from chairing this committee, and, I, I, and I've been told not. None of them are a pecuniary uh, advantage, uh, so uh, I'm happy if everyone else is to continue to uh, chair the meeting. Um, item three then, straight into the first of the uh, papers, which is, uh, oh sorry, no, the minutes of the safeguarding uh, meeting held on the 1st of September. Can I assume that everyone has had an opportunity to uh, read them and is happy with them? Item four then, the uh, report on uh, an action to prevent future deaths following the inquest arising from uh, the deaths in the Fishmongers Hall terror uh, attack. Uh, and I think we've got Trish Caldwell here to run us through the report, if that's okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to start off and then I'll hand over as necessary. So. The Safeguarding Overview and Scrutiny Committee is requested to review the report relating to the Prevention of Future Deaths report prepared by the Chief Coroner following the Fishmongers Hall terror attack. This report has been prepared at the request of the Chair of the Safeguarding Overview and Scrutiny Committee to provide assurance that relevant lessons have been learnt and that actions have been taken by the appropriate agencies to prevent future similar events occurring. The report provides background in that on 29th of November 2019, um, five people were stabbed, two fatally, in central London. The attacker, Usman Khan, a 28-year-old British national from Stoke-on-Trent, had been released from prison in 2018 on licence after serving a sentence for terrorist offences and was wearing an electronic tag. He was living at an address in Stafford at the time of the attack. The report explains that coroners have a duty to decide how somebody came by their death and where appropriate to report about that death with a view to preventing future deaths. The Prevention of Future Deaths report for Fishmongers Hall terror attack required 10 organisations to provide a response to the report and these included Staffordshire Police, West Midlands Police and the Probation Service. It didn't require Staffordshire County Council to respond. The report highlights the recommendations that impact on Staffordshire, these being the risk assessment process, clarity over agency leadership, prison actions to manage radicalisation, procedural issues, for example, formal structural meetings, and communications. The report provides detail on the key changes that these agencies have made which indicate that lessons have been learned from the Fishmongers Hall attack 
and that appropriate action has been taken to mitigate against future similar events taking place. For our local reassurance, Staffordshire Pre Prevent Partnership, together with Stoke-on-Trent's board, have considered whether there were any issues to address from a local perspective and no additional actions were identified. For further local reassurance, Staffordshire Commissioner for Police, Fire and Rescue and Crime held a meeting with senior partners and stakeholders to share learning, share current offender management arrangements, as well as relevant legislation charges, changes. The report concludes that whilst no local actions have been identified, the improvements that have been made at national and regional level will positively impact Staffordshire as any CT offenders being released into the county will be subject to these tighter controls. So uh, that's the end of my report. I recommend that the Safeguarding Overview and Scrutiny Committee reviews and notes this report and um, I'm happy to take questions as they, as they come. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there any questions? Councillor Pardesha. Chair, the, the crux of this report is to identify the failings of the system, so to speak, leading to the uh, tragic death of um, the two people who were killed that day. It is about the, the lessons that we can learn, how we can improve things to make sure, hopefully, this never happens again. I just have one um, question in, in particular, Chair. Um, at the start of the report, it mentions the attacker's name, which is clearly um, a Muslim name, and it says that this man was of Pakistani descent. Could I ask what the thinking was behind putting those details into the report, please? Um, I have to admit that I did not want those words to be put in the report. Um, I think they can be removed, but I don't know if Trish has anything to add to that. Yes, simply, um, if I could just add, um, those words are uh, a straight lift from the Home Office website um, where that context information came from, hence as putting them into the report. But um, Councillor Wilson did uh, pick that up um, when we were reviewing the report. Um, in that case, Chair, are we being told... Um, is this the final report? Can that be removed? Where, where does that leave us then? Sorry. My understanding, Chair, is um, it's our report. It's, it's been written by us. Therefore, um, we can remove it, would, would be um, my view, unless there's anything uh, that we're not able to do um, from a governance perspective. Certainly, um, as authors... We, we can remove it because it's straight lift from a, a context to give you background. Um, uh, Chair, if uh, I need to explain why I said that, I will. But can I suggest, please, that those two um, details are removed, please? You've left your uh, microphone off. Oh, sorry. I do think with um, a lot of these reports, as... Uh, Trish has just pointed out there, uh, is that this is a report following on from the coroner's report uh, and also one from the Home Office. Uh, and the way that they are described in both of those reports is how they are uh, described. Uh, and I do think that we ought to be very careful, um, uh, and there is a careful balance, isn't there, about how we report certain things and some of the words that we use. However, having said that, uh, if we are simply mirroring or echoing the phrases and words that have already been used by the coroner, then I do think that that gives it uh, the requisite uh, validity around us using those as well. I, I, I don't see the, the value uh, 
personally in changing the language of uh, Home Office reports. The, the issue here is, uh, and, I, I, and, and I also take slight objection right at the very beginning when you were talking about trying to find the failings. Um, I think those failings have already been found. Uh, the coroner uh, made it very clear what the failings were. The role of this committee uh, isn't to uh, find failings uh, in organisations. Uh, the role of this committee is very clear around safeguarding and unfortunately there will undoubtedly be like-minded individuals still out there living uh, in Staffordshire uh, and what we are here to do is to make sure that we are managing those individuals uh, properly and effectively to keep the people of Staffordshire safe. So I personally don't see the need to change the uh, language that's contained in it, but if the feeling of this committee is so strong that we should change it, then, then I, I, know, I, wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't fight it too much. But I do worry uh, a, a, about us constantly watering down facts, and these aren't words that we've used, these are words that have been used by both the coroner and, and the Home Office. Councillor Pardeshi. Thank you, Chair. Just two very quick points, Chair. My concern is that mentioning the name of this person who happens to be of Pakistani descent further demonizes um, the Muslim community and it embeds in people out there a stereotypical profile of what uh, an extremist is. Um, and it's important, particularly at this time, A, we have a choice, this is our report. Secondly, we are in dire financial straits as a country, and the far right in particular will look for scapegoats to exploit that situation. And unfortunately, that has meant and will continue to mean a further rise in hate crime and attacks on our Muslim members in particular. It also, lastly, Chair, detracts from the fact that we have in the, in, in the world as a whole, a far more um, far right and neo-Nazi threat in this world than we do have right now of Islamist jihads. That, that is a, a basic fact. And the NSPCC report recently, Chair, which I'm sure you're aware of, reported recently that a record number of our children are now being groomed by the far right. That is my concern. And um, the very last point, the far right um, chair, the neo-Nazis, the extremists, are not hiding away in their bedrooms behind screens. They're not on some far horizon out there. They're working and living amongst us. And if I can just highlight recently, over the summer, they appeared confidently and brazenly at a planning meeting just across the road at Stafford, Borough Council, at Stafford Borough Council. They were openly turning up in numbers, confidently recruiting, handing out leaflets and cards, holding the most disgraceful placards, and throughout the meeting, making the most horrendous, chairman, scary... A point of order, Chairman. We're yeah, discussing this we report, are, aren't yeah, we? We're, we, we okay. seem to be going chair, off, my off only the track here, My I only think. point yeah. is, Chair, it's not relevant and it demonises a certain community. That is my concern. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you. Thank you for that. I think, I, 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 I think the, the expression of how that translates into uh, the far-right threat, um, I'm not 100% clear. Um, and also, I, I, I don't think it's a fact that the far-right threat is the greatest threat to t of, of terrorism in this country. Um, I think far from it. Uh, I do think, though, that this is, it, this is public knowledge. This is within the public domain. We're not, we're not telling people something, uh, something, that they, uh, something that they don't know. Councillor Wilson. 
Thank you, Chairman. I think if the, um, if the person in question was from, um, from Spain or from um, Ireland or from wherever it was, I don't feel that it's relevant. So for that reason, I'm happy to remove those words from the report and, and that's an end to it. I, you know, I don't, see, I don't see how it relates into anything else. I just think that we can quite happily and easily just remove those words from the report if, if that's what the committee wants. Do the committee have any concerns around that? If, if you're willing to do that, I think that might be the easiest way forward. Then, uh, thank you for that, Councillor Wilcox. Uh, thank you, Chairman. The um, coroner listed ten organisations who were found to uh, um, collectively um, be responsible for 25 recommendations that come from the report. Um, and they mentioned the, the, the lack of sharing information and intelligence. And you just wonder whether with so many organisations involved going forward, whether or not th that, will in, that will improve the communication that is going on um, in, that, in relation to that. And then secondly, of those 25 recommendations, will, will anything in any way be followed through so that we as a committee will have some sort of assurance in the future that actually whilst none of them were attributed to our force. Obviously, in the wider picture, we want to have an assurance that these um, organisations are talking to each other and that the recommendations have been followed through. I'm, I'm sure there is a, a timeline for the recommendation, recommendation to happen. But it just seems to me there seems to be an awful lot of organisations who were involved in this. And it just makes you wonder whether, <coughs> with the lack of information being shared, whether or not there are too many people involved and whether or not it should be sort of less rather than more in relation to the organisations that are responsible for this type of um, unfortunate incident happening, Chairman. Just some clarification, really, and assurance, please. Thank you for that. Is that Chris? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, if I, can, if I can just give um, um, some background to uh, both of your points. <coughs> Firstly, um, around the number of organisations that were asked to respond. Um, clearly, there's, there's two elements. One is around the data sharing with appropriate people, but there's also who are they sharing it with and how many people. And, and one of the uh, clear failings um, that this report highlights is around different elements thinking that it's somebody else's responsibility. Um, so um, one of the key things is the reorganization of how counterterrorism policing works. Uh, and that's very clearly now with a, a single team within counterterrorism, um, a regional team, rather than some elements perhaps belonging to Staffordshire Police Prevent. Uh, so some of the organizations have kind of been taken out of the communication loop, um, which does make it so much clearer on whose responsibility it is. Um, but equally, um, around MAPA, so you know, when, a, when a, an offender is being looked at to be released into the community, there is clear communication now between the CT MAPA uh, meetings that happen and the link into the local mapper that is chaired by um it's it's police led um but uh, the local authority has a seat round the table of the local mapper so whilst there are still a number of uh, organizations involved that communication i believe is a lot clearer for people now equally uh, there's been a wholesale reorganization of the probation service as well um, which has has also brought together uh, two elements that now are back into the same uh, single organisation. So between those, I think the changes do actually um, enable a much uh, much clearer picture. Um, there are, I've, I'm aware that there's data sharing agreements uh, been drafted and put in place as well to make sure that communication between MAPA actually happens. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor McMahon. Um, there's a considerable amount of change being required of organisations in, in this report. And 
the, the best way, I think, to describe my concern is um, interim instability. Because change, it, it, some people don't like change for a start, but, ch but change always, although ultimately for the better, can make life more precarious and risky whilst it's happening. And what um, assurance can we have that through these changes, albeit I'm quite confident that at the end of the change, things will be um, considerably better, that through those changes, um, uh, people of Staffordshire and the rest of the country won't be m more at risk or at least as at risk as they were when, um, when the crimes were committed, simply because of the, uh, by virtue of the fact that there's so much change going on. Does that make, I'm not articulating this very well, but does that make sense? Yeah, um, if, I, if I may, Chair. Um, I think, yes, there is a lot of change going on. A lot of change actually had already happened and was in train as um, this tragic event happened. So, the, so, for example, the change to the regional policing uh, CT model has been in place some time now and, and is becoming embedded um, through the governance that there is, through the prevent partnerships, through to contest. Um, you know, that, that assurance comes through that route. Um, so we have that. And again, with probation, um, probation uh, changes um, have also happened, um, you know, over, it's been about 12 months now and that is beginning to um, settle. My own limited experience, because from a local authority perspective, we're not engaged in some of those conversations, quite rightly, because they're, they're CT and sensitive and only people that need to be involved in those discussions are happening. So from my limited experience, I certainly see that probation as a partner with the police sitting around a table and having those level of discussions that they need to have before anybody is uh, released. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we, we have, um, we, we have acts, we have a degree of police scrutiny through the um, police fire and crime panel. Um, um, it, where does probation sit with that? Because there's a lot of change required for probation here as well. And even though we, we have sight over what's happening with the police, do we have any sight over what's happening with the probation service such that we can be ass um, assured in that regard as well? I'm going to say no, but we don't sit on that panel, the police panel. The panel we have within the county council is the um, safer and stronger strategic can't say it, strategic partnership, and we have reports from various um, 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 members of the police force. Um, they bring to us all sorts of reports. I'm not sure that probation is one of those, though, is it? Probation is an integral part of, um, it's an integral partner at our board. I think the, the scrutiny comes from the contest board. I think the, the, the main scrutiny is from the contest board. But we, um, we, through our own governance, have probation sat round the table um, as one of our partners for Safer and Stronger. Um, and I believe um, a councillor does sit um, on a police and crime panel. But it's, it's not ours. Mm -hmm. I think the police is quite thoroughly scrutinised because we, we get it in full council every time we sit. Um, but we don't hear about probation so much. And, and I just think that in order to have, to be fully assured, we, we do need some um, um, probation sc scrutiny. If not directly, then at least through a third party that we can be assured that, that, that this is all going in the right direction for us. Thank you, Chair. Council Wilson. So um, after our Safer and Stronger strategy um, committees that we have. We have a, a, a conversation with the chairman of this panel here um, and if there's anything that needs pulling out from that that's within our gift to do then by all means we can bring that back to 
a future committee here. Um, that's only what's within our own gift to provide. We're not able to provide anything from the police and fire. That would be something separate. Thank you for that. I, I think the essence of, of this, though, is you know, um, dangerous people are managed within uh, communities and within local authorities. Uh, and Trish, I think you already mentioned the multi-agency public you know, protection arrangements uh, or MAPA around some of that. Um, for obvious reasons, a lot of that is done uh, in, in secrecy. Uh, and we will probably never know. I think the, the point of this report, though, that we shouldn't forget is that the coroner's initial report was absolutely damning about, about that process. Uh, and I think if we are talking about the, managing the very, or the most dangerous people in our community, and we don't have any direct feedback for obvious reasons from that, then when these things happen, it tends to uh, suggest that there might be something uh, systemically wrong with the whole process. And I think we've already heard that over 10 organisations are probably involved in that. And one of the criticisms was that they don't tend to speak to each other. But I think you also mentioned that uh, there is the contest board, which would, for me, tend to suggest that's the best place for that sort of scrutiny to take place. Now, um, I'm not suggesting that we have a report from the contest board, but I think we ought to look for some reassurance uh, that the, if the contest board is the right place for this scrutiny to take place, uh, at least we have some reassurance from that, that board that, that they are at least satisfied and happy that all of the uh, things are happening perhaps as they should. I don't know if that makes, makes sense. We, we've, we've, we'll take that back and we'll, we'll come back to you on that if that's okay. Uh, thank you for that. Any other questions? No? No. I, I think, just, you know, by danger of repeating myself, I think it was quite a damning report. Um, the management of this individual here in Staffordshire wasn't, wasn't the best. Um, and unfortunately, two young people lost their lives partly as a result um, of that. And I think it is important that, you know, we're not looking to find out what the failings were. Those are, are clear. Um, what we are looking for is some reassurance that uh, whilst we can't say these, this thing will never happen again, uh, we do need to know that there is a robust process in place that we're doing everything to mitigate that risk and everything to keep you know people uh, of Staffordshire safe having read through it uh, and also uh, having had the privilege of being invited along as a representative of this committee to uh, the meeting uh, I can say and having some previous knowledge of how these organizations work uh, it, it the the change through through all of these organizations is absolutely significant um, the probation service you know uh, around prisons how people are managed both in and out and on their release uh, the changes to counter-terrorism uh, practices um, is quite extensive and, and I think we can uh, take some reassurance from the fact that uh, we have learnt those lessons and uh, moving uh, on uh, positively from that I'm going to bring it to uh, a, a close. Uh, the recommendation is that we consider that. You know, unless there are any other questions, I'll, I'll close this item. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming and, uh, and presenting the uh, report to us. On a similar note, then uh, item five, the uh, prevent uh, activity. Councillor Wilson, are you opening? Chairman, I apologise for putting you through me twice in one morning. <laughs> Just b bear with me, though. So, um, so this report um, has been prepared at the request of, of the chairman of this committee um, to provide some assurance that Staffordshire County Council is carrying out 
the required activity to ensure that the organisation is meeting its duties in terms of the statutory prevent duty. So um, members here might be aware that the, um, the prevent duty is part of the government's overall counter-terrorism strategy known as CONTEST, as we mentioned earlier. The prevent duty was introduced into law by the government in 2015 via the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act 2015 and section 26 number one of the CTSA imposes a duty on specified authorities to have due regard to prevent people being drawn into terrorism. The act introduces a range of measures aimed at countering the risk of terrorism and radicalization and the prevent duty is a statutory requirement for Staffordshire County Council. Staffordshire County Council has a coordinating role for Prevent and chairs a multi-agency board that meets quarterly. The Home Office Regional Advisor for Prevent attends this board. Um, he acts as the, the critical friend, if you like, and provides guidance where appropriate. From, um, from our governance perspective, the Prevent Board reports into the Staffordshire Contest Board, which oversees all the counter-terrorism strands of activity and is chaired by, by Staffordshire Police. Um, the Prevent Board also provides um, updates to every Staffordshire Safer and Stronger Community Strategy Group, and the Chairman of this Strategy uh, Scrutiny Board receives um, a briefing followed the, um, S following the SSCSG, so is kept um, updated on matters of note. Um, a, an annual delivery plan is set based on priorities that are informed by the annual counter-terrorism local profile and completion of the Home Office self-assessment toolkit. Um, these priorities are detailed at numbers 8 to 10 in the report. Um, the report also includes at paragraphs 11 and 12 a reference to schools. Um, I was going to introduce um, Education Safeguarding Lead Vicky Hume, um, who would have shared some more detailed activity with the committee, but um, unfortunately Vicky is unwell today. So um, Trish Caldwell, um, who is with me here now, um, will be assisting with this. But before I ask her to do so, um, I'll conclude by referring to the paragraphs 13 to 19 in the report that advise members on a key part of PREVENT, that is CHANNEL. The report explains that through channel, vulnerable individuals who are at risk of radicalization can be safeguarded and supported, and the process operates in a similar way to safeguarding processes designed to protect people from gang activity, um, from drug abuse, and from physical and sexual abuse. To expand on the information contained in the report, members may be aware that um, a referral to channel can come from anyone anyone who is concerned about a person that they might know um, is at risk, whether that's a family member, a friend, a colleague, or a concerned professional through the normal safeguarding process. All referrals are carefully assessed to see if they're suitable for channel by the police. And for those cases where it's assessed that there is a risk of radicalization, they will be heard and discussed at the channel panel. This is chaired by the local authority and works with multi-agency partners to collectively assess the risk to an individual and decide whether an intervention is actually necessary. The panel is made up of a number of statutory partners such as the police, children's services, social services, education professionals and mental health care professionals. To ensure that all relevant agencies are engaged in the case discussion, a pre-meeting takes place a week before the panel, which meets on a monthly basis. Participation in channel is voluntary and confidential, and it's not a, 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 not a criminal sanction. If a channel intervention is required, the panel works with local partners to develop an appropriate tailored support package. The support package is monitored closely and reviewed regularly by that channel panel. The type of support available is wide ranging and can include help with education or career advice, dealing with mental or emotional health issues and theological or ideological mentoring. Ideological mentoring is common and can be led and supported by an intervention provider. Finally, members will note that no data has been included in this report due to data protection restrictions. However, the report does highlight the activity 
and processes that exist in Staffordshire to provide assurance that there is appropriate governance and oversight of PREVENT, including the annual assurance statement that is signed off at chief executive level. So uh, that's enough from me now. I will now um, ask Trish, please, to um, provide some insight into the school-related activity. If uh, So please, the chair may. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Um, so uh, Vicky, unfortunately, um, is our education safeguard and lead not able to attend. So I have some overview information, um, but we can circulate some more detailed information, including a case study that... Uh, Vicky was going to bring with her uh, this morning. Um, so if I could just say a few words around um, the work that happens in schools um, regarding PREVENT. Um, a, lot, a lot of awareness training um, takes place on a, on a regular basis. So, um, and some of that um, this year has gone back to being face to face again. Uh, the uh, counter-terrorism uh, police work closely with us they're very much part of our prevent partnership board um, they organize some events called synergy um, and we've had um, schools attend those um, and also uh, when we have the uh, counter-terrorism local plan refresh once a year um, so for example uh, last year's event we had over 180 attendees from our schools in staffordshire attending that event um, so we're making sure they're getting the information um, out there. There is something called the Staffordshire Learning Net. Um, this is a website based specifically for schools um, and there are a lot of um, obviously safeguarding information on there but there is a, a big element of it that is dedicated to prevent. Um, Vicky and her team um, in the last couple of years have, have introduced something called seven minute briefings. So um, literally what they say, seven minute briefings, they're on the website um, so that, that uh, schools can go in and get those snapshots of information and, and prevent awareness. Um, there's um, a, half, a half term, so twice a term is what I'm trying to say, twice a term there is a focus on prevent activity for schools um, that gets delivered out. Um, I think uh, it's already been mentioned about schools and channel, but schools are very much an integral part of channel. Um, they're always invited if there is uh, somebody from their school there. Um, and there is a, a strong representation that, that comes. We've had some good feedback from schools saying that they value being part of that um, discussion um, and they feel that they're supported through the, through the channel partnership um, to support um, those children. Um, I think I just want to also mention, um, schools do, do an audit. It, it's called a, a Section 175 school or Schools Audit. Um, there's a specific section this year um, introduced uh, where there are a number of questions for schools to um, rate whether they obviously red, amber or green at uh, that type of rating. A uh, number of questions um, making sure uh, whether the managers and leaders of the school understand their responsibilities in the education setting, that they can demonstrate they're protecting pupils, um, that they're actively engaging with, with parents, and a number of other categories contained within that prevent audit. Um, it's been done um, in the last couple of months and the report is being put together. And the purpose of that is to identify not only good practice and schools that are, are really achieving well, but where there's any gaps. Um, so if, if schools are reporting that um, they're, you know, they're a, a little bit uh, needing a bit more help on uh, prevent awareness for their teachers, etc., then that will then get picked up into the, into the program that Vicky and her team do. Um, in, in addition, um, there's recently been um, a PHSE coordinator recruited, very much working with adult safeguarding leads um, around the PREVENT agenda. Um, where, if there's any schools not completed the school's audit, th that team also will pick that up and go back to the schools to make sure it's a full 100% audit um, of the schools. Um, I think that probably concludes um, sort of my um, 
high level information um, but as I've said to members we will be able to um, forward uh, the case study and some further information from Vicky when she returns to work thank you thank you for that yeah, are there any uh, questions Councillor Wilcox Thank you, thank you, Chair. You, you mentioned that the, the audit trail for schools that perhaps haven't, don't participate. Is it, is it mandatory that schools have to participate in this work? And then secondly, are there, are there any links available to, to members so that we can sort of, you know, um, perhaps update or make ourselves more aware of these sort of situation as they can occur with people that we come into contact with? Uh, yes, um, certainly um, in terms of members' awareness and briefing, um, we are currently, as part of this year's Prevent Delivery Plan, refreshing training. The Home Office, um, the Home Office have, in the last uh, six weeks or so, updated the e-learning now um, on their website. So we're now in a position where we've got up-to-date um, activity again. So we are looking at a whole training framework again this year, and, and that will include members as a category to, for, for up-to-date awareness training. Um, so we'll, we'll cover off the uh, training. Sorry, what was the first element? Remind me. The other one was about our schools, are they mandated it has to do this work in the schools? Yes, yes, there is, um, it is, it is part of what they are required to, required to do. And actually building it into the audit process helps uh, the education safeguarding team make sure that where a school might be saying, oh, actually, we need some more help on this, those gaps are identified. Um, the high-level findings um, were out in time for the last Prevent Board, um, but they were only high-level, um, and the scores around schools actually recognising their responsibility for Prevent um, and understanding what that responsibility was within the education setting were really quite high. Some of the other areas do need some some help around training particularly thank you for that um i also think we shouldn't forget that the only because i used to be involved in this the 2015 terrorism act uh sets out a legal obligation for all organizations including the council including schools and universities the health service uh, they have under that act they have a legal obligation uh, to set out various things about making sure that all of their employees and students are made aware of PREVENT. And several schools have failed Ofsted's uh, uh, purely because of the 2015 uh, requirements under the Terrorism Act. Councillor Pardash. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I realise that we have a, a statutory obligation to provide this training. Could I nonetheless have two minutes to, to express my reservations of the prevent strategy in general? Uh, yes, I, you know, if you, uh, if you feel the need to do that. I think what we're trying to do, though, <coughs> is just to uh, make a judgment about how prevent is being delivered here in Staffordshire, not particularly to make uh, a judgment about the strategy itself nationally. And uh, I, I, I sense that this might turn into a political... Uh, no. 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 Uh, if, please yeah, do, if please it, do. If I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure people will... Yeah, um, if it sounds political, please okay. point it out Thank to you. me, Chair. I'm just asking for um, two, two minutes to basically say that it's widely accepted that the prevent strategy is not working. It's forcing teachers, doctors, social workers and others to report um, people vulnerable to extremism. It embeds discrimination in our public services. Thousands have been... Councillor Pardish, I, I'm going to stop you there. I think uh, these are unfounded allegations completely. Uh, the Prevent Strategy has existed for almost 20 years. Uh, it's been through, I think it's 10 uh, Prime Ministers, 20 Home Secretaries. Uh, I can't think of a strategy that has lasted uh, as long as, uh, as this. Uh, it's been reviewed at least five, I think maybe six times. Uh, and the view is that it saves lives. Uh, last year, the head of counter-terrorism in the Met uh, suggested that there are between 20 to 30,000 
what are called subjects of interest. These are people from both uh, the Islamist threat and also from the far right threat. Uh, and there is a huge, huge number. Uh, as was pointed out right at the beginning, this is a voluntary process. No one is made to uh, go on to this process. Uh, it, it, it is, for obvious reasons, uh, secretive and confidential. Uh, but if you were to know the number of young people that have been uh, or had their lives turned around from what would have been quite a, uh, a, a poor direction for them to travel in. Uh, and I do think just these wild accusations about it doesn't work and it, it alienates people in the classroom, uh, I'm not aware of any evidence of that. I think that's just purely an opinion. Uh, well, uh, Chair, thousands of innocent children, Muslim children in particular, have been swept up by it and lives have been ruined when there was no evidence that there was well, anything to do with extremism um, going on, uh, Chair. And the UN, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights said this has a negative and discriminatory effect on Muslim communities and its implementation is inconsistent with the UN Convention on the Rights of, of the Child Chair. Uh, we're having too many people stigmatized by it and people are actually changing their behavior, uh, Muslim communities in, in particular, are changing their behavior for fear of being stigmatized by this prevent strategy. And the definition of extremism in the strategy is so wide that thousands of people are being swept up by, including climate change protesters. It's, it's two, uh, what, nine out of 10 prevent referrals in 2017 and 18 didn't require any um, treatment for or radicalization or whatever. No, we, we have to uh, accept that it is alienating communities and I, I believe we need to get around the table again to rethink this and talking of the Home Office, was it just a few days ago we were told about the civil servants in the Home Office who have far right backgrounds. Thank you Chair. No, thank you for that. Um, are there any other any other questions? Councillor McMahon. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, uh, there's, there's, it would seem logical that there is a progression from grooming to radicalization online. And I, and I think the, um, the, the best way to describe it, actually, is, is B.B. Kidron, Baroness Kidron, who's a crossbencher, who runs an organization called Five Rights, which are five rights that children should expect when they're online, and they don't get them. And she describes the internet as being risky by design. And that's exactly what it is by the very nature by which it works. And it, um, I, I, for me, the, 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 the whole business of online risk is, is conspicuous by its absence in this report. And I just wonder where that sits. If I'm wrong, forgive me, but certainly the last time I read it, it wasn't there. Uh, and, uh, and, and I just wonder where that sits in terms of how we protect mm. kids and where they, um, uh, 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 what education do they get at school in order to, to manage their time online, in order to recognize risk, in order to be careful what they put on so that they're not, they're not drawn in mm. by bad actors who subsequently radicalize them. It's the, it's the one piece for me that's missing in this jigsaw. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. Um, and apologies that we weren't able to bring Vicky along today as planned, because I'm sure Vicky would have given you some reassurance around schools particularly in terms of what they do in terms of um, both the, um, if you like, the, the teaching and the awareness around it but also what they do with their systems um, and uh, th not just at school level but further education um, we have further education people um, represented around the table at the prevent partnership and they talk about how 
their systems that they have working in the background are able to highlight where uh, potentially people are accessing information that really is inappropriate. Uh, so, the, the, you know, the um, IT systems <coughs> are able to identify with their programs um, and reported that um, once people were back physically at school or college, um, that they were see that they were able to see that activity because it was somewhat hidden while people were at home working in COVID. Uh, if I may, thank you. Um, <coughs> there's two sides to this, I think. One one is the background intel what you described and the IT to be able to basically interrogate what people look at, um, which I think, despite the GDPR issues, I think that's perfectly justified given the risks we're trying to prevent. Um, but it's, it's also, how do you educate kids not to use these damn things all the time? Mm. Um, I, 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 um, it, it, it's, and it's not just a mental health issue. It goes on. It, I, I, you can see the logical progression from 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 being groomed to being radicalised. Um, um, whether it be whether it be irrespective of the ideology involved, whether it be from the right or from any other, um, and and therefore, um, to my mind, um, uh, um, that needs to be satisfied before we can fully assure ourselves that we've got a robust system in place. And I don't know enough about the legislation to know how much the prevent legislation of 2015 actually goes into this. But actually, the internet's far more of a risk now than it was seven years ago. <laughs> uh, and and in, in terms of you know kids having mobile devices, what they can access and all that sort of stuff. So I, I, I just think that that's something that we need to be concerned about and, and have um, some sort of view on. Um, I, I was I was a bit disheartened shortly before the um, shortly before the pandemic. <coughs> I, I tried to get um, um, uh, through Tim Moss um, um, and Philip uh, White at the time to get a, a multi academy trust interested in the um, in <coughs> in an organisation called Common Sense Media, which actually goes into schools and, and teaches kids how to manage this stuff and not become addicted to it. Um, and, and there wasn't a taker, unfortunately, and then COVID hit. And I would, I would dearly like something like that to be looked at again um, so that we can... It's an American organisation, but it, but it now has a foothold in the UK. Um, uh, and, um, and, and I think we should be looking at stuff like that because it's not just monitoring what they do, it's preventing them from, from, um, from feeling the need to do this stuff in the first place. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I, 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 I think from the 2015 Act uh, and what's called the duty, um, which is the legal obligation, uh, all schools should have a prevent delivery plan. And part of that plan is uh, how they manage um, online uh, threats. Uh, and, and there's also, I, I, I don't have the figures, but there's also quite a, an impressive number of uh, illegal and uh, uh, radicalizing sites that have been taken down uh, in this country. C uh, clearly, most of the difficult ones are hosted abroad, but those that are hosted in this country, there is quite some rigorous policing around it. I think, Councillor Wilson, you wanted to make a point. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to Trish. I'll, I'll, I'll say my piece afterwards. I was just going to pick up on the specific point that um, we can um, talk to Tim after this meeting uh, and pick up that conversation um, with him from before COVID. Councillor Pardeshi. Just very quickly, Chair, um, carrying on from Councillor McMahon's comment about how we prevent um, young people from being radicalised or groomed or whatever. Um, well, in my opinion, it's, it's a lot to do with making sure that we don't alienate our young people, make sure they have a sense of belonging and, and feeling included. It's when we start to alienate um, certain groups or people um, that, uh, that, that poses the, the biggest, uh, the biggest chan uh, challenge. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for that. Um, 
I don't want to sit here all morning quoting terrorism acts, but there was an, an act that followed on from that uh, that introduced um, something called shared values, which is something that schools use and I think covers the point that's just been talked about uh, there. It is about being inclusive and what are, they used to be called British values, of course, they're now called shared, uh, uh, shared values, but I think it answers that, that, that point. Um, Councillor Evelyn. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, a lot of us councillors uh, sit on school governing bodies and um, yes, they have uh, this sort of thing in place, um, to not only to monitor what the kids, the children are up to, but um, when they're leaving school and approach and coming to school in the morning, in my particular case, there was this duty teacher on, uh, outside just to prevent the kids and the, te and the parents dropping them off that they are aware of it. But I would like to have some information on what Johnny's just given us. Um, I'd like to certainly look at it um, if it's been if it's been put forward and turned down, it sounds as if the school bodies would like to have a look at this, Chairman. I think that to just to have a look at it, they don't have to pick it up. But it might be some points in there that the school governing body would like to pick up. So I'd like to have some information on that, please. Um, I'm sure we, if that, whatever that information is, we could probably uh, probably pull together. Um, I do think that we, the biggest threat isn't what kids look at online and in schools because there's all sorts of firewalls that prevent young people from uh, looking at those things. There was a report just at the end of last year uh, called Safe Spaces by an author called Hargreaves uh, and that talks about the real threat of young people sitting in bedrooms, hence safe spaces, uh, on laptops that have no uh, firewalls on them at all. Uh, and by far that is the biggest threat, not, not perhaps what, 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 what they're looking at in classrooms. Councillor Wilson. You, you just picked up there exactly what I was going to say, that yes, of course, schools have a responsibility, as do we as an authority, but you know, it's what happens when the children aren't at the, in, in those organisations. However, I do feel that we need to... Um, I think uh, Councillor McMahon's suggestion was... Um, eminently sensible and I'd like to go back and um, understand what happened. Um, I know obviously multi-academy trusts are kind of um, a law unto themselves so whether or not they take up people up on those suggestions is another matter but certainly something I'd like to investigate further. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor McMahon. Um, thank you Chair and, and, um, and Victoria Wilson. Uh, it, it's, it's all the more reason that we have to address um, um, discipline and behaviour as regards these things, not just monitor what, f what folk do and that, th and that that transfers itself to when they're not at school because that's what ultimately will protect them. Mm. Thank you. Yep. Can, I bring in, can I bring in Catherine Mann, Mann please? One of the things that we did pre-COVID at libraries was um, support with our community learning colleagues so staying safe online courses for parents so I will pick up with library colleagues to check that they've been resumed because you're right it's not just about what happens in a school environment it's what then happens at home so we've done that previously and I will check that they've recommenced post-covid thank you for that um oh sorry uh, Councillor Hookfield my, I might be wrong, and you'll tell me if I am, but I, I always thought it was part of the criteria for, within the education department. Right? And, and I've sat here and, and I've listened, and, and people seem to give the end the impression right, that there's a segregation between certain classes. My understanding is every person within the school, every child, is treated like for like. None of them are treated any different. And as far as I'm concerned, right, that's how it should be. And it's, it's, it'll always be like that, right? So to criticise from one against another is completely wrong. I think that then you, you create racism, right? And that's the last thing, right, that this council wants to create, right? And I think as far as I'm concerned, every teacher, right, that can 
educate the children will do so. Now, what happens when they get at home, right, and they're in the bedrooms, that's left entirely with them, right? We can't be responsible for them. That is up to the, the parents at the end of the day, right, to keep their eye on the children to make sure, right, that they are not doing such things as what go on, right? And I think that's what it's all about, really, right? And I think that's what we ought to concentrate on, to make sure at the schools they get their education, and not only the schools to get their education, but I think, really, at the end of the day, as it's moving along, right, and things are getting more complicated, I mean, nobody knows better than me, right, as far as computers, Right, I, I think at the end of the day, you've got to start educating the parents on exactly what is going on with the children because a lot of parents will turn around and say they didn't know it was happening, and it's usually when it's too late. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I think you make uh, uh, a very good point. Um, I think there is an analogy around some of this, though, with things like drugs, isn't it? I don't think there's any suggestion that children are using drugs at school, but there is uh, an opportunity for some sort of drug education within schools that helpfully equips them to resist drugs when they're, when they're not at school. So uh, I think that's precisely what this is trying to do, is to recognise that that uh, danger that exists in what are called safe spaces, sitting on beds at home when there's no policing with a small p uh, uh, going on. And you know, if people were to think that you know that that's an exaggeration, then uh, there was a recent case of somebody called Michael Piggin, um, who was going to uh, attack Loughborough University. Um, he's now in prison. It's all on the internet if you want to read it. Uh, and you would be surprised at the lengths that some people go to of locking doors. Parents didn't even know what was inside his bedroom. Uh, and in fact, when his mother bought him meals, she had to put them outside the door, go downstairs and ring a bell to tell him he could open the door to take the meal. Now, that sounds crazy, but that is unfortunately um, what sometimes happens. And schools have a responsibility to try to make sure that we do everything we can whilst they're in school, to protect them uh, against some of these threats when they leave it. Um, I'll stop there. Are there are, any other questions? No. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, I, I, I think it is um, a, uh, a really good report. Uh, I would make the point again, I, you know, I'd love people to show me another strategy that has stood uh, 20 years and uh, all of those different administrations, including a coalition uh, government. Uh, and the question I often ask when Prevent is criticised is, uh, what would be the alternative? What, what else would we do then to prevent young people and vulnerable people uh, from falling foul to uh, both sides of that um, terrorism uh, and uh, radicalisation argument? Um, I, 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 I personally think that uh, Prevent is uh, by far the best. And uh, and I think it's got a proven track record, and it would appear that it's been delivered uh, really well here in Staffordshire. Uh, Councillor Wilson. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just taking my opportunity while I've got the mic. <laughs> um, it's nothing to do with that particular report, but I'm just, um, it's page 29 on the work programme. If I can just bring your attention to um, the item for standing items 22, 23, and we've got the lead commissioner, Janine Cox, um, who's now left the organisation, so if that could be reflected, that would be great. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> item six, then, the work programme. Helen, could you take us through that? Thank you, Chair, and uh, noted I'll make that amendment. Um, so our next meeting is on the 24th of November. Um, and that is looking at the uh, Staffordshire Safeguarding Children's Board Annual Report um, and also um, the Regional Permanency Partnership. And we had that uh, quite a while ago. Uh, that was um, looking at the, the uh, new uh, establishment of a, a new um, um, coordinated uh, um, partnership in the um, 
fostering and uh, adoption process. So it's, it's looking at that again and see how that's developed and moved forward. The uh, Children's Board Annual Report is something that comes to us each year, but um, particularly, I think, in light of the peer-on-peer -peer, um, abuse report that you received um, from the, the work that was done that across the three scrutiny committees, um, there is some detail that we'll want to look at in there to see how things have been addressed, particularly around the issues that were highlighted through that work. Um, we're hoping also at that meeting to bring the outcome of the young carers work that uh, was recently finished. So there is a report that will hopefully be included there as well. Thank you. Uh, any comments on the work programme? Yeah. Councillor Moore. Yeah, uh, Chair, the um, Safeguarding Children's Annual Report, I imagine is going to be a lengthy document. Is there any way in which, will they also provide sort of a, a summary for us so that we can see the, the key elements from it rather than having to go through a, hundreds and hundreds of pages of a report potentially, just to help us, do you think? I'm sure we can feed that back. To say, uh, brevity is of the order. Um, Council Wildman, I think you were next. Hang on, Janet. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think at our pre-meeting we mentioned there were a potential issue with family improvement uh, boards uh, across Staffordshire. I'm just wondering whether there is an update with that. When I say an issue, I think they were moving online temporarily, but I just thought if we've got information about that, that would be great. Thank you. Perhaps we could try and bring that yeah, forward. Yeah, I'll try and include that. Sorry, I'll see if we can get something for the November meeting for that as well, shall we? Thank you. Councillor Eagle. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just would like to uh, pay Helen a compliment on the report. I thought it was um, very in good detail. Yes, it was long, but it made enjoyable reading. But I have to say that face-to-face -face meeting we had with the children and Place One, I thought was so beneficial. I learned a lot that night. I don't know about you, Chairman. But I learnt a lot about that night, and some of it's kept me awake as well, some of what those children had to say. But it was, a, it was useful, and I would encourage we do it a lot more often than we have done. I don't know how you feel about that, Chairman. I, no, I, I, I thought it was an incredible meeting. Uh, the one thing I took from it was I learnt that I was also a young carer when I was, uh, when I was young, when I sat listening to them. Uh, I thought it was quite emotional as well, and I think, you know, I, I, I struggled at times when you heard. Uh, and I think two of the things that came out of it, uh, one was uh, unsolicited praise for various organisations and people, which I think is encouraging in itself, isn't it, knowing that these people are working away in the background. Um, and also, uh, there, there, there were some concerns about uh, whether we're meeting the needs of young people when they want to talk through. And I don't think we would, we would have known that had we not have done it. So uh, I, I, I thought it was an excellent meeting, it really was. And I, like you, I, I reflect on it still now about some of the things that were done and said. So, uh, and hopefully, uh, as you've seen from uh, Helen's excellent report on it, we, we, I think we can take some tangible things forward and we can make some improvements. I, I, I think it reflects a good service, but like all things, it's one that we could probably improve as well. So, so I thought it was great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any more questions on the work programme? Thank you. All done. Uh, can I thank you all again for uh, coming and, uh, and, and, and the contributions? Uh, I think it, it is important and it does make uh, some real valuable difference to the way that we deliver some of these things, some of these quite, uh, as we've heard, controversial things here um, uh, in Staffordshire. So thank you very much. And I'll close the meeting. I will try. <laughs> <laughs>